How you doing today? Good, good. I just came from a retreat, so I'm like, ah. Ah, what's your one takeaway from the retreat? Um, basically helping businesses. The three things that we need to work on for small businesses is education, capital, and reform. <laughs> ah, capital, okay, and reform. Yeah, reform, change legislations, qualifications that leave out the little guys out from bidding into any projects. That kind of stuff. So. Okay. That sounds like that was interesting. Reform, I haven't heard before. The other two, of course, the education. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you got some great takeaways from yeah. the retreat. Yeah, I'm the president of the Latin American Business Organization. So, Oh, excellent. And the what the Latino uh, community is the number as the fastest growing home buyer population uh, in the country. What's kind of interesting, I was born and raised in a community called Inglewood. And you often hear about it in the news. Um, it's a lot of crime. It's a crime-ridden neighborhood. And a lot, Chicago is seg- uh, segregated racially and economically. So what's kind of interesting though, right now in Inglewood, the number one investor is Asian, while the number one increase in home buyers are Hispanics where mm-hmm. African-Americans won't even buy there. But so many investors from across the country are now looking at Chicago because we often provide a better cap rate. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah <laughs> and that is my that is my client base. All my investors are not, you know, when I'm talking about millions of dollars and not Latinos, mm-hmm. but the home buyers, second home buyers are Latinos. So I have a mix there. Oh. Excellent. Well, you won the hot seat. It was a competition we had a couple of months ago where we asked for people to share their successes and you were sharing some of your successes. So one, I want to thank you for your willingness to share. And then you you won this month's hot seat and we have one more hot seat winner already planned for next month. But let's dive into your questions. I know you, you, Ask me something about commercial. I'm going to give you my best commercial answers and uh, some resources for you to connect with. But let's dive on into this month being June hot seat winner. Hey, Elizabeth. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and to be selected. Um, There's so many questions I have. Um, One of the things I do know is, you know, as I said to you before, I'm the Latin American Business Organization, the president of that. I'm also a real estate agent. I also have a property management company. So all these things, I really do a lot of commercial. All these things really, you know, when when a female leadership takes that role, there's more challenges than, you know, than there is. So when I'm talking about investors and that what have you, one of the things I do is I do what's called return on equity. And and what that means is we do some analysis on people who have been, you know, had a commercial property, let's say it's $7 million and they into the loan, two years into the loan. What we do is we turn on, on the equity, which means that the rate of return that you had when you first bought it is different than today. And a lot of people feel like, oh, the more I pay, the more I'm going to, you know, get better high return. But it's the contrary. The more you pay towards it and you build equity, the less rate of return. So what that means is that when you get to that point that you started at, I don't know, say 14% rate of return, three years later, you're down to seven, then it's time for you to move your money, your equity. Okay. And this is a niche that I have that, you know, I do a third, I, I used to be a computer software engineer. I have a computer science degree, so I'm all about data and numbers. So this is something that I have a niche on that I need to learn how to capitalize on it because I can go to all of these folks that are either, you know, have no mortgage or been in the mortgage for seven years that are thinking, hey, I'm doing great, when in reality, they can be buying more stuff by moving the equity. So how can I capitalize on that niche, that knowledge to go out to these folks? Um, So what, uh, 
I think that your hot seat is actually in, it's in alignment. It's perfect timing. So two weeks ago, I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and I'm on our economic development uh, committee. And we actually interviewed Moses Hall, who's 30 under 30 for NAR. We interviewed James Doherty. We interviewed um, Tony Hardy, who runs the Keller Williams division for uh, Keller Williams Chicago One. And we also interviewed Sarah Ware. Now, with Sarah Ware, her unique proposition is she is a minority disadvantaged certified brokerage. That means that when CBRE Ellis does Chicago public school sales and they are mandated to have a minority vendor, she is that minority vendor who gets, I think, 25% of all of their deals. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So um, you might want to look into becoming certified as a female minority business. That would be first and foremost, um, mm -hmm. because now she's able to move into other marketplaces and her specialty is providing those analytics. OK, mm -hmm. what James Doherty shared with us, he just uh, him and Corey Gilkey, who owns Leaders and Fry Style, so he owns a clothing brand and he owns a restaurant. They just secured two point four million dollars in grant to um, renovate a corridor at the corner of 51st and Calumet here in the city of Chicago. So even after they had invested, they leveraged grants in order to do the renovations for the project. What's interesting about James Doherty is he was born and raised here on the south side of the city of Chicago and started off as a residential real estate agent. Right now, he's the number one commercial broker in Inglewood, California. And what he's doing is he actually leverages the 1031 exchange, mm -hmm. where in California, he has uh, his clients who have sold their properties there because kind of similar to what you stated, um, the cap rate is lower, therefore, the cap rate is high, lower, therefore, they're getting a lower return on their investment. And they're investing in Minnesota, Chicago, a lot of Midwest places are now giving a uh, better cap. So the one gentleman whose property he sold in California, he was able to do a 1031 uh, exchange on six different properties. James was responsible for three. One of the parcels that he invested in was it kind of, this is crazy. So we had Tony Hardy and we had James Doherty. Tony Hardy was the listing agent for the highest commercial sale in Hyde Park. Hyde Park is home to the University of Chicago, the most expensive college to attend in the Midwest. And the anchor store is a Boston market, but that's not why they bought it. They bought it because they're only this investor only wants to buy strip mall centers, commercial properties that have a DaVita uh, on the premises based on the, uh, I guess, the leases that DaVita is doing and the higher return on the investment. Um, and so the 1031 exchange, which as realtors, when we're going to Capitol Hill, we got an extension of because they're trying to do away with our ability to be able to do a 1031 exchange. So as much information on um, the 1031 exchange. So becoming a minority disadvantaged certified business, um, looking at those other marketplaces and how can you leverage the 1031 exchange for that? And then what else? If you were to go back and look at all of the clients in which you've helped, what I advise, because oftentimes we don't have the knowledge and other realtors might not necessarily share that information with us, is if they are financing, what is the organization that they're financing through? Only because I now want to take their top producing loan officers out. I want to know what are they seeing? What kind of analysis do they want? How can you leverage your skill set um, in order to in order to serve that group of people, right? Um, and so when you're not able to, you know, not I'm not going to say not able to network, but when you don't find people willing to give information, I want to go to other people in that network that I might not compete with 
to see who can give me the answers that I need. And because I came into this industry as a loan originator, I encourage everybody to go talk to the loan originator Mm -hmm. Um, because they're going to tell you how to get your deals done. Or more importantly, as I explained, they tell about the different overlays that exist because, yeah, FHA will go down to 580, but each bank has an overlay to the 580 FICA score. And then last but not least, um, which is probably the most stringent part and something that NAR is working on, and that's earning the CCIM. Um, mm-hmm. They understand that the courses are very expensive. It takes a lot of time away from your business. So mm-hmm. they're working on uh, some entry-level courses for those seeking to be in the, uh, in the commercial industry. And then identifying top producers and other market places Mm -hmm. Um, because they're more willing to give information if they don't find you to be a threat or their direct competitor. Mm -hmm. Right. I I do a lot of 1031 exchanges um, and also I'm getting into, you know, directing them or educating them about the DST, Mm -hmm. you know, the Delaware Statutory Trust which is another way, especially in this market, people, some investors don't want to sell because they say everything is overpriced. But but, so there are options that I do with my investor buyers. Um, So, you know, so that was one of the questions, how do I capitalize on that? And I think the other thing is, you know, um, as a, like, for example, um, being the president of the Latin American Business Organization, I have a lot of new businesses come on. You know, we just had a class that finished. There was 39 graduates, which 35 businesses are going to be established. So that is also another area that I don't try to mix it, you know, between my real estate and commercial and that. But, you know, helping these businesses buy or lease property so they can grow is one thing, but I'm getting also a lot of, you know, opportunity there to really be that, that go to and say, Hey, you know, you're starting out, we can do a workshop on leasing versus buying what type of SBA loan you need in order to be able to buy the property, you know, and, and utilize 51% of it. So a lot of that I have, and I just feel like I'm not capitalizing that as I should, because I tend to, you know, it's it's just been a struggle because of a female, you know, sometimes when you work with, like I said, uh, most of my first time home buyers, second home buyers are Latinos. And then the ones that are spending 1 million, 4 million are not. And they come from a culture where women are not, seen as equally as we here in the United States. So there's been some challenges that I've been able to prove myself and say, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I talk the talk. I know the numbers. But, you know, I don't want to come across being too pushy in terms of, hey, you know, I know you have this network of investors. How can I get into that network? So how would you go about pursuing them to write <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to give you one more resource, which is the REAP program. I don't know if it's only here in the city of Chicago, but I wanted to throw it out there because I want you to hold me accountable to giving you the information for that mm-hmm. program. Coming back to the question that you just asked, um, <laughs> as a African-American female who is short, Right. Because height is also uh, mm-hmm. uh, a stereotype. And I know when I walk into the room, people look down because they anticipated that based on my bigger personality, I'm taller. Right. So African-American female who's short and overweight. Right. Um, it's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, stereotypes that come with every last one of them elements. The reason that I have so many designations and certifications and degrees is because when I had a, uh, came out of undergrad, I thought that I should be married. I thought I should be young and married because mm-hmm. my parents were young and married. And um, I went to go see a madam. And the madam told me that education was like an apple tree. The higher up you go, the less likely you are to get picked over. 
So the first thing, you know, is the continuing education, right? And you talked mm-hmm. about that based on the retreat this weekend. Mm-hmm. What I have leveraged in my business is the ability to collaborate with other people. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes I'm collaborating with men. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say it is 100% okay to collaborate and to initially do short-term collaborations. What I have realized over the years, I've had mm, six, seven partnerships. None of those partnerships did I ever bring one penny to the partnership. I've never brought money to a partnership. Mm-hmm. I've always brought knowledge to the partnership. Mm-hmm right? And all of these partnerships, we've all made money. And I've mentioned, I think in the past that all my partners are ethical people. However, I grind a little different than most people. I love work. And so it doesn't, it's fun to me and Mm -hmm. I like it. So I generally outwork every partner I've ever had. And I, I, you know, I really, it, it, they, uh, It's a few months in, a year in, and I'm like, yeah, this don't work for me. You can get all, you know, I didn't educate you, trained you, we making money, and you still working like a turtle. (laughs) Yeah, let's get out of this. (laughs) So what I would recommend um, is looking at potential collaborations, partnerships, where you could earn the same amount of money, but because you're bringing in a male figure, based on the stereotypes of the Mm -hmm. client, not based on your stereotypes, based Mm -hmm. on the stereotype of a client that you would still earn the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. Because what you said was one to four million dollar deals. And it's not that you're not knowledgeable, you're the most knowledgeable person there. How about you look at partnering, right, with someone bringing your knowledge to the partnership, right? And you look at five to ten million dollar deals because when they see that prominent man there they might be willing to spend more money which then means you don't make less money that you would make as much money to get the deal done and because it's a higher price point you might even work less Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um because the goal the the question is people aren't going to leave the front door open for us Mm-hmm. Okay, the, the front door is not left open. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we got to figure out how we're going to get up in this house, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to climb through a window. We're going to scale the building, come down through the chimney um, by every legal and ethical means necessary. Mm-hmm. We still want to accomplish the goal. And so start identifying people or even, and let me say this, I tend to stay away from family members. I'm working with Skylar simply because I, I raised him, right? Um, I'm, not, I'm right. not, yeah, I'm not seeking another family partnership mm-hmm. ever again in life and don't really want this one. But because I'm his mother, I'm willing to uh, help them out only because my family partnerships have not gone as well as the partnerships I have with non relatives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, yeah, I would, my family has been the lazier. <laughs> of the two sets of people I've ever worked with. <laughs> and I've had new, the, the best partners, I, my mother was my absolute all-time best partner in life because she, she grinded and she worked different, right? And I'm trying mm-hmm. to keep up with her. Um, and then my grandfather. Uh, other than that, mm-mm. but the goal is that once you start operating in, the, in that new circle, you might even identify some other people, but maybe a, a a limited partnership to test it out, not for all your business, but to see if you have the feeling, right, that mm-hmm. uh, makes you feel like you're accomplishing these goals and people aren't questioning you because you're a female. And to that, what I tell realtors when they come into real estate, I'm always looking at where they can uh, start their career Not, you know, everybody says, oh, I want to do this because I live here. I want to do that because I work there. No, let's go back and look at these numbers. Let's look at the community Mm -hmm. that you're going, that has the uh, fastest rate of sale 
at the highest price point, and that might be a property type, might not be a community, right? Mm -hmm. But with the fewest barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. And and so because Chicago is so segregated, right? Race is a barrier to entry. Language is a barrier to entry. So when you're looking at this property type, location, everything, What's going to give you the least, the fewest barriers to entry? And even though the Latino market is a very fast growing market, is there also a a female investor market Mm -hmm. that might appreciate you more? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So either the female investor or even the non-Latino investor or bringing on potentially a male partner. But if you bring on a male partner, to me, you would want a higher price point. Would be some of the strategies um, so that you can make the same amount of money. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I did have a deal for, they wanted about 68 million and we're trying to, and I did find a buyer, an investor buyer. We were like 40 million and it was a beautiful, you know, um, luxury um, 164 units in Boston, but it didn't work out. We were trying to negotiate, but, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely if I bring some partner that would get me to that level and help one another out, that would be, that'd be great. My husband did mention it. He said, you should probably, you know, not that you're not capable, but you know, it's just the way it is, right? You have to prove yourself that you're capable of doing that. But, oh, yes. uh, And and you're more than capable. I mean, you probably the most capable person, but based on stereotypes. Right. Um, And that's and that's sad and unfortunate. But that's true. I mean, like and it's the craziest things that people have a stereotype about. I remember when I was in pharmaceutical sales and I was the shortest, darkest, roundest person in my home, in my division. And when I started losing weight, I could tell people treated me differently. So a very good friend of mine, she started doing Weight Watchers. She works for um, uh, a division of PepsiCo. And I told her, I said, watch you get all the promotions you want now. And she did. She got several promotions back to back. And it wasn't just the weight. She also started wearing braces and straightened her teeth out, right? Mm -hmm. So someone saw her not too long ago. And she says, Marky. The girl, woman should have just told me I used to be ugly. I said, why? She says, wow, you look so different. And Mm -hmm. I said, well, you do know you look different, right? She was like, yeah. She was like, but it was, you know, like she was mesmerized. I said, well, people can't help it. You ain't aged. And actually, Mm -hmm. she's cuter now than she was in high school. Um, Mm -hmm. But people, the looks, the the tea, all of this plays a role into how people perceive us and whether or not they want to do business with us. I agree. And and the confidence that you portray and the knowledge, you know, but yeah, I mean, I definitely have been in in commercial for a while. So, and I want to grow more in that area. So definitely, I think bringing a partner is good. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I just won the From Home Snap for 2022, the most viewer agent out there. And again, congratulations. Thank you. Now, how can I capitalize on that? be able to bring in some leads from that? Well, I want to come back for one thing. Okay. Um, and here's another joy of being a minority. If you become certified, if you're the most skilled person, they have to use you, period. And mm-hmm. so be, being a certified minority business would often have more men come to you because they'll mm. need you to get their deals done. Mm. Right? Yep. Because they need because they might not qualify as a man, right? But if you're uh certified, then there's deals that will be presented to you because you meet the mandate and the likelihood is you might not have a lot of competition for that in your marketplace. Mm-hmm. Cuz Sarah has really no competition for that in our marketplace. Mm-hmm. And now she has all these great relationships. So I just wanted to come back because now not only can you, you can even be more picky with the person, but now people will seek you out for mm-hmm. who you are in order to get the deal done. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And before Oops. you answer my, my other question, let me ask, let me tell you another thing. 
So um, one of the one of my investors' clients is doing cannabis business. So um, you know that is a space again, right? That you're looked at as a female minority. Like, what are you doing in that? Um, and I noticed that there's not too many wheelchair women doing that. So um, I'm learning a lot about that. I'm learning about the license and what have you. And the person is, um, you know, he's African-American, the investor. So he's like, yeah, let's get this going. Let's continue to grow this, this particular type of business and you're my realtor and what have you. So again, how can, you know. So I want to come back to the cannabis business. Yep. Um, the reason I want to come back, there's a young gentleman out of Chicago, licensed real estate broker. His name is uh, Michael Malcolm. Uh, he has mm -hmm. recently relocated to California to work for a cannabis company. Mm -hmm. Now, out of everybody who I mentioned from last week, two weeks ago, that was on the panel, Sarah Ware, Moses Hall, Tony Hardy, James Doherty, and then we had a lender. Uh, his name is Pierre Dunnigan. Mm -hmm. None of them do any commercial in the cannabis space because that is not their skill set. Mm -hmm. So what I've come to realize is that if there were a handful of commercial brokers who wanted to dominate the cannabis space, the opportunity exists. Oh, I'm going to add one more person to that. The number one multifamily agent in the city of Chicago, Kevin Rocio. So a couple of people have reached out to me um, because of the cannabis business. And I'm like, well, let me see. I've personally talked to every one of those people and did not have a referral for them. I did. It just simply wasn't one that existed. Mm -hmm. So as much knowledge as you can gather, as many cannabis conferences as you can go to, um, I would encourage that because that is a segment that you can dominate whether you're certified or not. Because of the newness and the nuances of the industry, I've not come across none of my go-to people know anything about that sector. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so from the cannabis, <clears throat> you know, what are all the building requirements? Uh, my understanding is, you know, they use a lot of water. They're supposed to have a special lighting. The lighting helps with the growth. The better the lighting. Um, the more you, the more growth you can have, right? The better mm -hmm. quality. Like it's a whole lot that could go into this. The filtration the system, yeah, the zoning and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so whatever classes you could take on that. When it comes to the home snap, um, I believe I'm gonna put a logo for everything, and you have to be willing. And this might go against cultural beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the willingness to toot your own horn. Right. Um, it, one, women tend not to do it as much as men. But I was raised to think like Oprah. That was what my mother would always tell me. She says, girl, I need you to think like Oprah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have no problems talking about myself and consistently reminding people about what it is that I do, because to me, that is 100 percent marketing. Mm -hmm. And I love marketing and closed mouths don't get fed. And mm -hmm. so with the um, most viewed profiles when it comes to home snap, you could weave that one sentence into a bio, right? They sent over graphics with that. Have you mm -hmm. used the graphics um, when you are talking to people? Is it like a hyperlink in your email signature? And mm -hmm. so every day, every other day, Gently reminding people through your captions, through your photos, what it is that you do. And I update my bio every year mm -hmm. um, for, for something new to add. The numbers have improved every year. Um, but you want to consistently put that out there and just kind of mm -hmm. weed it in. Me being an ending, you know, closing keynote speaker is a part of my bio. So I hear it time and time and mm -hmm. time and time yeah. and time again. Um, and so coming up, uh, and what I do when it comes to my speaking information, I have one folder on my computer. Mm 
-hmm. I have all of my speaking documents in that one folder. That includes a headshot, my uh, W-9 form. I have a uh, before hired, once hired, and aftercare letters already typed, written out. I go to that folder. I'm copying, pasting, and attaching. Mm -hmm. So bringing that document into uh, maybe your 2022 marketing folder mm -hmm. and then leveraging it consistently uh, using uh, that PNG transparent frame mm -hmm. on your picture, no matter where you put your picture. Mm -hmm. From yeah, from home snap, but the cannabis to me right now, I don't know anyone in the commercial space. Um, and I've reached out to people. Hey, you want? They're like, girl, no, we don't even. They don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, the same um, investor uh, buyer, um, he also is into logistics with Amazon, so he is like, all right, you're gonna get me some. You know, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Let me just turn this off here. Uh, so he says, you know, I need space for my trucks, for my Amazon trucks. So I'm also in that space as well with this investor and another investor. So again, you know, just having the time to really put it out there and say, hey, I can help you with this. This is the step you need to do. Maybe do a seminar or something or so yeah, so I have a lot going on as you can see. So my next question is, how can I bring people that I can trust to help me navigate with the existing clients that I have and will have you well, focus on these two big things that could be big, huge? <laughs> um, the first thing I think we, um, and this has been something that's consistent. Everybody likes to hire people who they like, right? Um, who often they have things in common with. And I would say, I want you to think about hiring someone who's opposite. One, decide on people who you need as a team and then decide on people who you need to bring in as an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people who I work with are independent contractors. And I spend a little more money for them because they're owning and operating their company, but it also means I don't have to train them. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, they also deliver at a higher rate because they're consistently learning and updating to come back to me to keep their contract. OK, mm -hmm. so some things you might not need to have a long time, a, a long term hire like Elizabeth, my website designer or my virtual assistant or my podcast producer. There are certain things that they do. They do it well. They're excellent at that they keep their certifications up to date, they're taking their classes. Do I spend a little more money for them? Yes, I do. But I'm still operating one, what, month before last, I was operating at a 1% cost of goods sold. Um, mm -hmm. Freaking unreal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a very high profitability. When it comes to hiring someone to, in today's real estate market, to me, we have to decide, do we, you know, are we generating enough income? So are we looking at before transaction, sales and marketing, or are we looking for, we need a buyer's agent, we need a listing agent on the back end, right? I always know that if I keep my sales and marketing running, I can always refer deals to other agents and get a percentage of the deal, whether I oversee it or not. Mm -hmm. So what do you need an independent contractor for who you might have to spend a little bit more money on, but mm -hmm. they're going to know everything about the job and you don't have to train them. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is, do you need to hire uh, before the transaction or once a lead has come in, right? Mm -hmm. And then divide that workflow out. For me, I started with sales and marketing because I always wanted to generate those leads based on our business model, based on how real estate is structured. I can always do a referral transaction. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of how I decided that uh, I would set it up. And I, I will say this, and I've had my independent contractors, all of them for a couple of years now. Well, with the exception of the virtual assistant. How did I come about the virtual assistant? 
I watched a video from the director of education for Canva and he gave a list of certified Canva creators. Now I'm in a group with a long list of Canva certified creators because if Sandy doesn't work out, I got other people. So I start following other people and grouping them because I know that on my sales and marketing or any of my marketing, I always want to hire a Canva certified creator <clears throat> because anything they create, I want it to be an asset in my Canva account. Mm. Yeah. Um, can you share that list with me? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can share the list with you. Awesome. Yeah. So I, you know, I love Canva. Thanks to you for introducing oh. it to the first. Um, you know, um, through the first training that you provided, and I love it. So if I can have someone that can do a lot of that, and I try to be consistent with the schedule that you provided, doing, you know, posting things and social media and what have you and doing video, but you're 100%, 150% correct. Video does involve engage more. And um, I just did a, and photos too. I just posted a photo of a Brazilian dancer with me yesterday. I got over 200, <laughs> I got over 200 viewers. And typically I get about 50. So I'm like, hmm, I should use her for my marketing. <laughs> yes. But Do you dance? I dance salsa, yeah. Oh. And my dance and stuff. Let me say this. If you were to create videos with you dancing, and then like if you throw a hip out, and it's a bullet point, a bullet point, a bullet point. You know, how many ways to finance commercial property? Boom. You know, <laughs> two, three, four, right? People will eat yeah. the video up. Um, Skylar and I are presenting together at Inman in uh, Connect in Las Vegas because he's had great success with his Instagram reels. He, they're averaging 14,000 views. Now, keep in mm. mind, he is not in, his face is not in any of the videos, and mm. he has about 1,700 followers. Wow. But every last one of those faceless videos, there he's averaging 14,000 views. Wow. So, um, and in the commercial, here's another thing. In the commercial space, there's not a commercial broker who stands out. Mm-mm. to me I, I Moses Hall stands out he's 30 under 30 everybody who I mentioned to you is a top producing um is a top producing commercial broker in their market period mm-hmm. um they just all happen to also be of color but they're all top producers um in their marketplace all of them have a social media they have social media presence but none of them are killing the video space mm-hmm. so to show your personality right and you already know that you have a lot of Latino clients, right? I'm giving them salsa, you know, but I'm going to make it entertaining and educational, mm-hmm. right? You know, three things you should, uh, ten, five things you should know about a 1031 exchange. Mm-hmm. Those would be the different videos and you could give them a little dance, you know, dancing to your next building, you know, I'm getting the whole feel. <laughs> Thank you. So um, that That's would be great. a great way. Yes, most yeah. definitely, because people like that. All of my dance and silly videos have done very well, but people know I mean business because I'm consistently talking about business, but I have fun while yeah. doing business. Yeah, especially for the cannabis fun. Oh, you know what you could do with, like, to me, you could have the absolute most fun because I'm going to do parody on being high. You know, decisions you make. <laughs> I'm going to come up with all sorts of things. And, and I would educate them. Every mm-hmm. element that you learn is a, is a teaching moment. So mm-hmm. every zoning requirement, you could do, did you know? Did you know? Mm-hmm. And what other industries could that impact? Because it's not just cannabis. To me, that would impact any, any green leaf that could, you could grow inside, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, There's so many things. There's like, you know, CDB oil and and a lot of stuff. And there's right now there's a lady that does wine. So I mean, so there's a lot, you know, other than just that. What um what I'm also thinking about that you could parlay that into would be aquaponics. Mm-hmm. So so um a lot of uh 
items that are being grown now are grown indoors, but they're grown um, on a wall so they can mm-hmm. use, you know, the eight foot wall. So that whole cannabis industry, I can also see a benefit if you're looking for a uh, indoor warehouse space for aquaponics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basil, a lot of the herbs and things of yeah. that nature, they're grown in an aquaponic system. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. This is great stuff. I just need help with assistance and putting They want to know together. what is your Instagram account? It's at Liz Cruz Realtor. One, I think I have two because um, when I... When I created the, I created the first one, which was the personal one, mm-hmm. and oh, maybe I have a question for you on that. I created the first one; it was a personal one. Then, when I took your class, I created a business to get analytics. But then somehow, I have two accounts. So how can I merge those two? But it's Liz Cruz Realtor. Um, so let me see how you can. The only thing I've learned that we could merge were the um, were the Facebook business pages. So let me see how to merge two Instagram accounts. Yeah. So I know I need to give you the Canva certified creator list, information yeah. on the REAP program. Yeah. And how to merge, if it's possible, two Instagram accounts. Yeah. Same thing with um, TikTok. I have two accounts, so. Okay, yeah. And when you, um, if you have the ability to merge, I'll find that out. But I would say you would put everything together under, well, here's the thing. It don't matter which account you decide. You can switch that account once you decide through your settings. So mm-hmm. through your settings, you get to decide if you want it to be uh, personal, private, personal, business, or mm-hmm. creative. And the mm-hmm. reason for the creator account is to have access to all the music. Oh, okay. Good to know. Yeah, I did when um when I was showing one of the buildings for my clients for cannabis. Mm-hmm. I did a TikTok just for the first time. And I, I did get quite a review, you know, quite a few people reviewing. I'm like, and it was faceless, it was just going through the building. So um definitely I need to work on that as well. Matter of fact, while you're saying that, let me come over here because uh, Michael, let's see, and I just love him. Um, What's funny is when he was, he was in my, um, he was in my continuing education course. And this had to be 2017, 2018. Since then, he's been in Forbes, Chicago Sun, Times, like he's been in every national publication about cannabis. And it started with him doing a weed travel food, which was his blog. And he was doing essentially people do wine parents. He was doing a, uh, we have a tornado watch. He I was know. doing a, um, a weed pairing. Okay. So his name uh, for anybody who wants to know who this young gentleman is, cause I've seen him just take off. <laughs> Unreal Mm -hmm. is Mike M I K E G the God. So M I K E G D A G O D. His name is Michael Malcolm. Um, He's now the chief marketing officer of um, it's called Cronja Culture, which is a cannabis company. He moved out to California made a few months ago and they've already promoted him to the CMO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's still a realtor at At Properties. Oh, and he became a adjunct faculty at Chicago City Colleges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Very and I, he, he might be 30. <laughs> he's pretty young. Um, and just to witness his growth in that mm-hmm. cannabis space lets me know. Um, but if you go, you're going to get a lot of, on his page, he talks about cannabis every day. Mm. but he would be a good person. And if you think that he could help you, I uh, definitely reach out to him and say, Marky, uh, say reach out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I am allergic to to pop. 
And it just came about that I, found, you know, I got this investor buying, looking for logistics for his Amazon truck, but he's also certified for wholesaling cannabis. So he was like, I also need this space. So I'm like, all right, I don't know anything about it. So I'm learning with him and his partner. And I'm like, okay, good. I'm like, I'm capitalizing on this because this is not something that everybody wants into every day, but there's a big demand. There's a lot of states that have yet to legalize it. So I want to be able to to be ready for that. So um, it just happened that um, he introduced me into that based on his business. But I'm like, I cannot go in a building when it's that or anything because I'm allergic. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. And my son says, you mom, you're doing that? I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing it. I'm just helping my client. <laughs> So it's pretty interesting. Oh, that, yes. And the thing, uh, also becoming a minority certified business and and to have that cannabis knowledge, then means that you can consult people, you mm-hmm. know, nationally, so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's one space that I want to capitalize on and, and help others. I'm about, you know, sharing my knowledge and helping people, so. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so that's good. Is there... um. So when, when you come, you know, is there, because I'm looking to hire it. Uh, I had a personal admin, but she kind of um, got really sick with COVID and decided that she wasn't coming back to the office. Is there, you know, is that something worth having? Or do you still have a virtual assistant and an in-office personal assistant? So our office, we've seen both. Um, we definitely have people who come, still come to the office, come to the office all the time. Are there some people from a real estate office and from an association standpoint that don't have, have not come back? Most definitely. My question would be, what role is this person playing? And the reason I say that is because I've done a lot of deals with Skylar and he doesn't come over. He doesn't necessarily come over to my house. He doesn't live here anymore. Um, and we can essentially do everything that needs to be done with him living 30 blocks from us. So he lives 30 blocks from us. Mm-hmm. Um, with all the different communication tools, I don't think you have to see a person face to face or have to see them often. And here would be a prime example. The Residential Real Estate Council, there was a young lady who worked there for years. During the pandemic, they just, she was working at home. She, we all made everything work, you know, for almost two years at home. As soon as the world opened up, then all of a sudden we want to mandate people to come back. They mandated her to come back. She quit and the whole department failed, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, who you got now? Because this don't work. And she did a fabulous job before. She did a fabulous job at home. And when she left, everything just kind of fell apart. Um, So I want to know, like, what are the functions that you believe the person has to come to the office to complete or to see you? And is it necessary? Because essentially we're trying to force people to come back into an environment, but we got our highest produ- productivity out of them when they weren't there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that, um, you know, my, my objective is I don't mind working remotely as long as we can get the job done and we're staying in contact. So that's not the concern is just um, having the ability to, you know, drop off checks, pick up checks and that kind of stuff. That's where it became like, oh, I don't want to go out, you know, it became a little bit of a challenge. So she decided um, she's not going out at all? Yeah, she was, you know, oh, I don't feel well or I do it tomorrow or whatever. And sometimes you have to pick up the check in order for them to change the status on the, you know, the um, MLS. So it was just becoming too much for me because I'm like... We need to change that right now. Otherwise, I'm going to get like 20 phone calls. Like, why is it still available? So, or, you know, if I was the buyer's agent, um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, that it was changed and, and everything was in place. So these kind of things, I guess, you know, some people take advantage and they just like, oh, I like staying home and not going anywhere. So I think that was the case with this. So I just want to make sure the question is, 
able to go out and do the errands when it needs to be done. So then my question would be, um, if there were certain things that she was doing a really phenomenal job at, could you reduce the amount of hours in which you were using her and then essentially hire a courier service or something of that nature to do mm-hmm. drop-off pickups? Because our association, we have a courier service that they use to drop mm-hmm. off packages, generally Monday through Friday. Mm-hmm. But um, what I've come, because I've had to change some of my lifestyle preferences, um, mm-hmm. To And my son, my youngest son has a driver only because it's a horrible utilization of my time. And I hired a driver for him. And it was the absolute best thing that I could do because it takes me an hour round trip in both directions. That was 10 hours a week that mm-hmm. I absolutely didn't have not to drop somebody off and pick them up from school. Mm-hmm. Um, and my husband's like, well, you all should be talking. First of all, on his way to school, I like him to get into him like he don't have to talk to me. I'm not the parent who pulls up to school and then we hold another 30 minute conversation Mm -hmm. because I am so aggravated by those parents every single Mm -hmm. morning. Right. Mm -hmm. You are. We already know what the course of action is for the day. And I like I like time to myself. He likes time to himself. Um, And so he gets to school every single day, but is with a driver. His driver cut the grass for the city of Chicago in the summertime. So he had to stop early this year. Guess what? The next door neighbor, she came home from college. She now takes him <laughs> and drives him, <laughs> right? So um, maybe a courier service, if, if, if it's that one element, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. you could keep her on the office task and maybe bring in a, a driver, courier service, secure package, pickup, drop off, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's a service out here there that does that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can still have the best of both worlds. She can't get paid for as many hours because mm-hmm. she's not running errands now. And there are errand uh, services as well. So mm-hmm. if you think there's some things that she understands and can do extremely well, um, but she's just not coming out, I would say, how do we reduce our hours where she's paid adequately for the hours in which she works? And mm-hmm. then do you bring in someone who is skilled, right, to pick up drop-off packages in a timely manner? Yeah, it sounds good. I need a driver, too. <laughs> yeah, look, best so I can thing, look at my <laughs> best thing I, my best investment, because what I got back was uh, essentially, if I'm taking him to and from school, right, that's 10 hours a week, that's 40 hours a month. I got back 39 hours. Mm-hmm. And whether I do something with that 39 hours or not, that's my choice. But I got those hours back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can certainly use that because I'm all over the place in Massachusetts. So I'm like, you know, rush into the office, making an, an offer, what have you. So if I have a driver and I have to rush back. Yeah. So. Think about it. It was I, at first, you know, looking at it from a monetary standpoint, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I, it, I had to take on another uh, another employee, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. Within a week, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And the, here's the thing. I don't have a driver. Mm-hmm. Austin has a driver. <laughs> <laughs> I but, know. But it also helped me with when he decided to do track, mm-hmm. right? He coordinated that with the driver. Today, I come home, he's at home. He had early dismissal. He coordinated that with the driver. So he's taking responsibility and I, he's in driver's ed. So the goal is that he's definitely going to get a car. Um, but yes, best thing ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I should consider getting a driver. Yes. <laughs> Think about it. I know. <laughs> All the work you can get done, right? Yeah. From yeah. one location to another. And yeah. the more expensive, you know, the higher the price point, the more you can justify it. Uh, Rebecca Thompson, she's with Colwell Banker. Um, she was, I think, like a regional president for a woman's council. She's had a driver for a very long time, especially with her higher price point clients so that she can spend time getting to know them. But she doesn't have to search for park in downtown. None of that. They're taking her mm-hmm. from property to property. They mm-hmm. get every place on time. Mm-hmm. And now she has a, a better relationship, more intimate relationship with her clients. Mm, that's very interesting, especially mm-hmm. for the Boston area where there's no parking. 
or I know we we came there for the national convention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> but we'll be back idea. for another national convention in the future. Awesome. Yeah, this is good. Great ideas, like always. Well, thank you very much. I was like, with the commercial, I was like, let me, let me see, Marky, where you going to pull this from? Um, and, you know, I don't profess to be a commercial expert, but because I'm not, I'm friends with a lot of commercial <laughs> experts um, and conveying those different um, situations and what a buyer or seller are looking for with them. So what I need to do is give you the list of the Canvas certified creators, um, mm -hmm. the reprogram and see if we have, if it's also in your area. And then how can you merge your two Instagram accounts? Yep. Sounds good. Do you have any more questions for me? No, I mean, I, this is it. I'm <laughs> sure once we, we finish here, I have tons of it. But um... Well, if you have some more, definitely feel free uh, to reach out. So guess what, everybody? I need you to make sure that you're registered for the Accredited Distressed Property Representative designation. We're going to meet for four. It's not four. We're is not four consecutives. We're going to meet for four Mondays. We are going to take July the 4th off. This is a course that I wrote back in 2008. Got a whole story to tell you. It initially is four three-hour classes. We will not be online for three hours. We're going to condense it down, um, but we are starting to see more notice of defaults come to the marketplace. So we thought that, or I thought that now was the time that we bring that education back to the members of Six Figures in 12 Months. Um, and so I will see you guys 